And we are now recording live. Uh, Doc T here with chronic protein deficiency in horses. Uh, this is one of the horse talks that I'm putting together in my effort to bring information to uh, horse owners everywhere. Um, how important it is to know a little bit more about horses than just uh, where you last left them and uh, how to ride them. Uh, I have a website called thehorsesadvocate.com, which just about every one of you knows, knows about. If you don't know about it, you should check it out, thehorsesadvocate.com, and become a member. It's free. The only reason why I need you to become a member is um, because I'm not your veterinarian, and I want you to um, – uh, except the, the terms of that. Other than that, it's free. I have uh, thousands of photographs, hundreds of articles and videos, uh, all the Horse Talk web, webcasts. There's over a dozen of them now. I've given them every uh, first Sunday of the month uh, with all sorts of different uh, topics. And uh, my Horse Sense uh, sessions and Ask Doc T and, and everything else. Just is a learning place. It's a trusted source of information because I have no affiliation with anybody as far as um, um, a sponsor or uh, representing uh, anybody. For instance, tonight I'm going to be talking about protein. I might recommend a couple of protein sources, but I'm not affiliated with them. I don't get a dime from anybody. This is just my beliefs. But uh, that's me. That's a picture of me. I, of course, you can see me. I can't see me, but you all can see me. I guess I'm sitting here. Uh, in front of this beautiful backdrop. <clears throat> and uh, I'm a, a veterinarian who went to Cornell um, about a thousand years ago. And um, But I was a horseman before I became a veterinarian. I went to, um, I worked on a thoroughbred breeding farm and, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, you want your webcam on today? Yeah, is it on? No. Oh my goodness. All right, I thought I had my webcam on. Uh, how about now? Is it, it's there. I'm there. Yay. Okay. Now you can see me. All right. We're going to adjust this just a little bit. Um, okay. Good. Um, here in Florida where I live, all the way up to Vermont and all the way out to Seattle, Washington, just taking care of horses. Um, and I get to see a lot. And, and I want to get to this protein thing uh, in about four more slides, but I just have a little bit more. I'm, I'm stalling, trying to get a few more people to, to get in. I know uh, horse people are notoriously, notoriously late. Uh, I'm one of those horse people who love to be on time and get things going, but I have to accommodate for people. Great. All right. Um, a recording of this webinar has been started. Let me just double check and make sure that's happening. Yep, it's recording now. And that should go up sometime in the future within 24 hours at um, thehorsesadvocate.com forward slash horse talk. You see this um, link right here at the bottom of the page. Uh, can you all see my arrow, my pointer? I made it gigantic so everybody can see it. Um, but ho thehorsesadvocate.com forward slash horse talk and you'll be able to see the replay. Now, who's helping me in the room right now is my uh, wife over here, Kathy. She's over to the right on the far side looking at me. Um, and on my left uh, over there is Matt. Um, and they're uh, the technical advisors and uh, encouragement crew. And there I am with my cowboy hat. I just want to let everyone know I'm getting quite a few questions through the question way. So if you want to actually chat, there is a chat versus pass. All right, if you guys can all hear that on your uh, display, you'll see a chat at the bottom, and you can start asking um, or just chatting things like, hi, how are you doing, things like that. Uh, questions we're going to save for actual questions that we want to ask. All right, so let me slap that out of the way. All right, it's way down at the bottom. Okay, now, uh, and this is me uh, floating a horse, and here's Melissa. Uh, she and I travel all over the country, work with horses. We use hand floating, but more importantly, we use horsemanship techniques uh, to connect with horses. We don't automatically drug. We don't hang your head from the ceiling. We don't use power tools. Uh, this type of floating, we find, uh, not only is 
uh, in the best interest of the horse, but is just as good as anybody else floating teeth out there. Um, and, and that's just the way we feel. We call it equine dentistry without drama. And you can always go to equine dentistry without drama dot com uh, to get an appointment to see if we can come out your way. I travel to all states, but there are restrictions according to laws, and I have to follow those laws everywhere I go. On uh, many of the states, you'll have to have your veterinarian there when I work, even though I am a veterinarian. But I am licensed in 10 states, and there's two other states that uh, don't require any licensing at all that I can go to. Now, <clears throat> just another side, we also have a horsemanship dentistry school, which you can go to horsemanshipdentistryschool.com, where Melissa and I take students uh, from around the country and hopefully around the world and teach them how to apply this technique and connect with horses using horsemanship skills. So I think um, if you've got a pen and paper and scribbling these things down, that's great. If you don't, you can always go to theequinepractice.com and uh, you can get to anything that I do, theequinepractice.com. All right, I think uh, we've waited long enough. It's eight minutes past seven and I wanna get into chronic protein deficiency in horses. I've divided it into five basic uh, discussions. Uh, the introduction is going to be, um, every, every one of them has a really good point to be made. Uh, but the one thing that might scare you if you get down toward the bottom, you're going to see math. And I know when I say the word math or physics, uh, a lot of people cringe and they, they get a blank screen in front of their eyes and like nothing gets there. I promise you, when I put my paper out and, and that talked about proteins, um, it was it was uh, well received. In fact, on Facebook, usually I get maybe a thousand, it tops 3,000 people. There's over 160,000 views, which just blows my little mind as far as uh, people are interested in protein, in, in protein deficiency. And I'll tell you what, I'm seeing it everywhere. Now that I'm looking for it, it is in front of me almost every day. In fact, just last week, I went to a farm that had not only good nutrition, but they'd had their veterinarian out there just the day before to look at this horse, and he never mentioned anything. And they had hired a nutritionist, and the nutritionist had gone over their whole feeding program and made recommendations uh, within the past year, and they were following those recommendations. And still, this horse, uh, who I've known for years, is starting to fall to pieces. As you can see, the top line of this horse, the backbone is showing. Uh, he looks just horrible. I've got another picture of this horse later on where his cheek muscles are almost flat and gone. And these guys are doing everything that they're supposed to be doing, and apparently they're not um, getting the results they want. So if you have a horse that has a top one like this, even if he's not old, this horse is about 20. But a 20-year-old shouldn't be looking like this on the top line. And here's some hooves that I've taken over the years, all the cracks, the chips, the lines. You see how this hoof is deformed here? And you can see the deformed hoof down here uh, and the cracks and the chips in there here. If you have a bad hoof, I'm going to explain to you tonight why that might be. But before I explain something to you, I want you to understand it's time for horse owners to have a mindset that benefits their horses. And what I mean by that is a lot of us have beliefs. We're ingrained in our beliefs because somebody we knew and trusted has told us what we need to do to raise our horses, or in this case, our asses or mules, this is uh, uh, Big George, um, uh, mammoth uh, ass, uh, great guy. Uh, but we have to change our mindset. So when you come in here, I want you to be open. Now, several of you are going to be wide open to take this in, especially if you say, gosh, how can I get my top line right? How can I prevent lamenesses? How can I prevent all these immune problems that we're having? What can I do that's simple and basic? And some of you are going to come in here and say, look, I know all this stuff, and I've been doing this for years, and this is what I want to do. And you have a lot of detailed questions. Well, I just want you to know that this is a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a theory that I have that has yet to be absolutely proven through time, but I've seen enough evidence that I believe that my hypothesis is true. And I encourage you to try my hypothesis that chronic protein deficiency is the root cause of many unexplained medical issues in horses. And that's what I want you to think about. I'm going to lay out a foundation for all of you to understand how protein works, what proteins are, how you can judge if your horse is getting enough proteins, and then go ahead and take an action if you feel like your horses aren't getting enough protein 
and move forward to see if you can resolve some of these issues. I've got old horses that have gotten on protein that have gone from being listless and ready to call uh, in for the euthanasia solution, and now they're running through the field. Um, I have horses that um, are uh, not, well, I'm going to say not become lame. We, we really don't know until 10, 20 years from now if this is really going to work, but they're trying to use this to prevent lameness. They're trying to use this for uh, other conditions like skin issues. Here, let me, uh, let me go over some of these things. This is one of the things that hit me down here in the um, athletic world of horses near uh, Palm Beach. Uh, the number of horses that have suspensory uh, ligaments that are a problem. Uh, I can't tell you. I'll go there to, to float teeth and I'll say, yeah, my horse has been laid up. It's got a suspensory. And, and, and it just blows my mind how prevalent these things are. Check ligaments, bow tendons, drop pastures. How many people have seen horses where the bass fetlocks have just dropped almost to the ground so the pastures are parallel to the ground blows my mind how many of them are are out there now i started with horses back in 1973 so we're talking 43 years ago at the time of this recording and i never saw drop pastures we never even knew the suspensories and check ligaments were ever a problem they just didn't exist now it seems like every horse has that and let's look at laminitis laminitis has been around for a long time but in this degree, I mean, it seems like so many horses have laminitis, poor hooves, seedy toe, white line disease. That was a new one. That was in, in the in the vernacular when I was in vet school. All of a sudden, all these horses are getting white line disease, cracks, thrush, splayed hoof walls, crushed heels. And in the immune suppression department, you have rain rot and scratches, ventral midline dermatitis. Uh, that's those itches right along the belly. Insect hypersensitivity, crud, recurring heaves, pardon me, hives, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and then we have some other things that seem to be just blowing up out of proportion. Allergic bronchitis that leads to COPD or heaves, epistaxis in racehorses, that's a fancy word for nosebleeds as they run. Uveitis in, in horses' eyes, pituitary dysfunction, which I had a whole seminar on before, which everyone uh, says my horse has Cushing's disease, my goodness, if I, I think all the horses are going to die pretty soon because they all have Cushing's disease. And that's all pituitary dysfunction. But as we all know from my last webinar, that pituitary dysfunction is really a breakdown of the nerves from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. It has nothing to do with the adrenal glands or ACTH or, or um, cortisol in the blood. That's all secondary to the primary problem. What's causing that? Is it, could it possibly be? A protein deficiency, and of course this one here, old age. Now I've always said um, your age is in your heart and your mind. How old you are, whatever number we've given us, is just documenting how many times you've circled the sun. And these horses don't know how old they are. Yet we'll see horses with a sway back, a poor top line, flattened cheek muscles, they're stiff, they're listless. I didn't add in here, but they have a pot belly, they have a hay belly, their belly just hangs out. Well, I'll tell you, if all of you just got up out of your chair and just uh, leaned over and put your palms on the ground, so you're standing on your feet in the palms of your hands, and just let your belly go, the only reason your belly would stay up is the muscle support that holds it up there. But if they're chronically depleted in protein and those muscles that hold their abdomen in start to get weaker, their abdomen's also going to pop out. And we've seen horses that are put on protein and um, – I know we've got one gal listening tonight. Her horse is boarded out at our place. Um, we've got one horse that has been on a, a protein, a high protein diet for about a month, maybe six weeks, two, two months, something like that. And the top line is now uh, starting to flatten out. It's looking better. Uh, the horse had uh, actually had too much fat up there, but with no exercise at all, the top line is starting to come along. But more noticeably is her belly's gone. And that just is just amazing to see the belly just completely go away as the muscles start to get stronger and hold everything up. So I've got four beliefs here that I want to go over. The first belief, horses have developed for their natural ha habitat, but human captivity is not natural. This comes to me from a veterinarian I just met, a wonderful guy up in Georgia, amazing um, uh, experience we, we met for the first time. He says, Jeff, look, I don't believe in a lot of this uh, 
stuff that goes on with horses. I believe that a horse should be able to live naturally in its environment, given the food that it's supposed to have, and it should do everything just fine. And my response was, yes, that's true, but in human captivity, as soon as you put a fence and a stall around it, you've limited his choice to the variety of proteins that are out there. And I'm going to get to this later, but if you don't have all the essential amino acids in the proteins, uh, then you're not going to have good good um, uh, development of certain proteins. And I'll get to that in a second, but just keep that in the back of your mind. If you homogenize or make available only one form of protein, whether it's hay or, or grass, and you don't allow the horse to get other forms of protein, he will be deficient in protein, even turned out on a beautiful lush field. So human captivity is not natural. Second belief, horses can adapt to all physical stresses applied to them if given enough materials to work with. And this is one of my pet things, and I'll put it in another term. Let's just pretend that I send to your farm a truckload of lumber, enough lumber to build a brand new barn for you. And I bring in a whole bus load of workers who are there to help you build that barn. So you have all the lumber and you have all the workers. And then you find out that all I've provided you with are finishing nails. How good a barn can I give you? Not very good. And a lot of people think their horse is a lumber and they're giving them an exercise program and they believe that through an exercise program, they can get a good top line and get a sound horse. But I'm telling you right now, if you're only working with finishing nails or not all the proteins that you need, not all the amino acids that you need, the branch chain amino acids that help build the connective tissue, you will have a horse that will either break down or will never get that top line that you want. I'm telling you, my hypothesis is that we are deficient in all the, in, in the horse getting all of the amino acids they need to build the proteins. So you're basically giving them finishing nails to build a barn. My third belief, all horses are individuals and have individual needs and ability to overcome physical challenges. We all know that. You can see one horse, he's 34 years old, and still looks like the little pony's going to buck you right off the next time you ride it, and it's a little devil. And then you have that 18-year-old horse that looks like it's on death's doorstep. Every horse is different. We have to understand that. So as you feed one horse, that the next horse that comes along, you feed it the same way, may not get the same benefits out of it. There's a huge genetic component and, frankly, a, an intestinal fortitude, I call it, or a willingness for a horse to, to thrive given what it's got. That's definitely individual. So don't come to me and say, I need to feed this for all my horses. Every horse is going to be different. And you have to be good enough horsemen to recognize that. And my fourth belief is damaged tissue can't be repaired with protein. If your horse is foundered, you can't make them unfoundered by feeding a lot of protein. However, protein can prevent the damage in the first place. And if we uh, give enough protein to these horses, we might be able to prevent some of these uh, changes, such as laminitis, suspensories, drop fetlocks. But once the fetlocks are dropped, you aren't going to be able to help them. Um, by the way, there's a ton of experts on the subject, and I do not claim to be one of them. I am not an expert of protein. This is just a foundation for you to build on your feeding program. I welcome you to bring in all the experts you want, to challenge them, to discuss these things, but I want you to have the basics so you can understand where you might be missing in your care of your horse. Now, if you take everything I say to gospel and go out and do it, and you get tremendous results, I want to hear about that. I also want to hear from people say, hey, doc, I tried what you said, and it didn't work. I want to hear all this because you guys are going to become my test group. You guys are going to prove or disprove my hypothesis. But I think at the time that we're done with this uh, webinar, you're going to say, you know, this is worth trying. But we all know the horses that survive for a very long time with us. But because of us, we need to address – I'm sorry, without us. But because of us, we need to address these unnatural factors athletic use, and limited forage. Athletic use could be anything from you go out trail riding every day to working cattle to uh, racing your horse around the track or any other event where you ask them to build their muscles up. You must be able to supply them with the materials to repair the damage that you're doing to the muscles and to make them grow stronger. You must. Every bodybuilder out there knows that they need protein because if they're lifting weights without the protein, they're never going to get the results they're looking for. And the limited forage means if you put a fence up, 
and you limit the amount of hay that horse is given, the amount of grass they have exposure to, you're limiting the amount of proteins that they get. A horse in the wild will select a various uh, amount of, of different types of protein. I'll call it a smorgasbord. I can't spell it, so I didn't put it on here. But you all know what a smorgasbord is. You go to that buffet, and you pick and choose what you want, what you feel, what you need. These horses will actually pick and choose. As one of my clients said, if I let my horse go and just wander around on his, with me on his back, he will actually go up to the rocks that have lichen, that green fuzz that they've got on it, and that horse will actually scrape the lichen off and eat it, and then he'll get up and go away. He doesn't need much. But apparently there's something in there that he's looking for. Okay. Uh, so far, that's just my introduction, so I'm not expecting any questions, but I'll take a brief pause. I'm going to take a sip of water. Now, all of us have to become scientists for a moment because we have to understand what proteins are because it's probably the most misunderstood thing. Most people know that horses need water, salt, um, minerals uh, such as iron. They also need sugar, meaning carbohydrates, and fats and proteins. And everybody's big on this carbohydrate thing. You know, low carbohydrates, no carbohydrates. Um, we all understand that. They're talking about insulin resistance. I get it. We all get it. But when I come to proteins, now this is really funny. Um, you guys can see me, right? Okay. This is what I, when I ask every horse owner, I say, okay, how much protein should a horse be getting? And how much protein are you feeding them? And I get a variation of this. I don't know. Nobody can answer that question. And it's, it's fascinating. I shouldn't say nobody. I've had a couple of people actually have told me, but it, they're so rare. So let's go over it. Proteins are made up of amino acids. And if you, you look at the alphabet, you know that in our language, in the English language, there's 26 letters in our alphabet. So look at the amino acids as letters because there's only 20 amino acids. And as you put these amino acids together, you form words. And words are made up of syllables. So the words are the proteins. The syllables are shortened proteins. They're segments of proteins. And I'll tell you why the, those peptides are important to know. And if I gave you a dictionary, it would have all the words that are possible in that dictionary. And they're all made up of 26 letters. So if I take one letter away, let's say the letter E, and I say, spell for me the word the, you would only come out with the TH because without the E, you can't spell the word the. If I took the W away, look at all the who, what, why, when, all those words would be gone just with one amino acid missing. So that's how important it is to have all the amino acids to make all the words because when you have all the words, you have an infinite amount of thoughts uh, formed in sentences. And so proteins are basically uh, build things. Uh, they build your liver. They build your immune system, the cells. Um, the fats build the walls, but what transports inside and out, they're all proteins. If you look at every cell as a factory, and they, they, they take in all the amino acids, and they throw them through this little factory, and out comes, according to their genetic code, the proteins that they need, that's what it is. You have to supply all the amino acids for these cells to put out all the proteins that they need. All right, so there's 20 amino acids. I call them AA, and you're going to see them listed as AA. When you see that, I'm going to be saying amino acids. Now, they're divided into two groups. You have the essential amino acids and the non-essential amino acids. And I say there's about 10 of each. It's you know, debated that maybe there's 9 and 11. You know, I don't want to get into that. You just need to know that there's essential or EAAs, and non-essential, or NEAAs. Think of them like vowels and consonants. Um, they're just unique groups. But I'll tell you what the difference is. Essential amino acids are basically those that you have to consume in their entirety. The non-essential amino acids can be converted from other things. Basically, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur, they come together and you can make them. Now, I know all of you out there know what cow hay is. That's the hay that you wouldn't feed to your horse that's only good for a cow. A lot of people don't understand this, but ruminants, you know, like the goat that's sitting on top of the garbage pail, a pile with a tin can in its mouth that's fat and happy, 
The reason is because ruminants can make almost all of their amino acids. They don't need to eat the essential amino acids. I think they need only one or two. And the rest of them, they can make themselves. It's what's unique about uh, ruminants. But horses and humans are very similar. We need half of them, about 10 of them, to be consumed in their entirety. And if you're missing one of them, you're not going to be able to make them. Again, spell the word the without the letter E. So there's three limiting essential amino acids. That's lysine, threonine, and methionine. And almost all of you have ever uh, used a hoof supplement like biotin. You're going to see in there something called DL-methionine. And that's exactly what it is. And what's interesting about methionine, it is ha it's one of the two amino acids that has sulfur in them. And those sulfurs can come together and create a, a, a bond. Um, Let's see, can I see myself? I can't see myself. I probably could if I hit something here. But I don't want to, I don't want to break away. But can you guys see me? For, okay, so the sulfur bot. So I'm going to hold them way out here. You can't even see them. But here's the sulfur over here, and here's the sulfur over here. And they come together, and they bond together. And it folds the amino acid. And by folding it, it gives it strength. But what's really interesting is the thionine can't make disulfide bonds. That's what's really cool. So the horse takes methionine and it converts it into an amino acid called cysteine. And then it takes cysteine and converts it into cysteine. And cysteine that takes these disulfide bonds and makes it the strength. What does that have to do with horses? Pay attention because it has everything. Guess what makes up 26% of the hoof? The hoof is total protein. 26% of it is cysteine. And if you're not getting enough D-L-methionine in there, which is one of the three limiting amino acids, which means the horse can't really find a lot of it in the natural environment, it has to take it from some other source, and we give it to them, and it creates the cysteine, and then the cysteine, and it makes the disulfide bonds. It folds on itself and creates the strength it needs to have the hoof structure that you need. I mean, just with that one piece of information, you guys can turn, click me off, and move on. You've learned a lot of why a hook, horse's hoof will start to bend and, and, and splay out on one side. I mean, yes, you've got to balance a hoof so you have the forces, and, and, and it's landing properly. I get it. Those are the physical forces being applied. But if you don't have the strength, if you're building a barn with just finishing nails, and a small breeze comes along, the whole barn is going to tip to the one side and fall over. And that's what's happened. We're applying stresses to these horses, and they're try trying to fight these stresses with faulty material. They don't have all the amino acids. And so you have a hoof that's not as strong and capable. So you have cracks, you have chips, you have splaying, you have uh, abscesses. Uh, you have all these things that, are, are, that shouldn't be occurring because I believe the horse doesn't have all the uh, amino acids you need to make a strong hoof. I said 26% of the hoof is uh, just one amino acid, but that means 74% of the hoof is all the other amino acids or a combination of them. So it's really important that you get all the amino acids in if you want a really good solid hoof. <clears throat> the variety of port, uh, protein is so important. Okay, we're moving into the next section here, and I want to give everyone just a second if you have a question. I'm going to take another sip. All right, nothing? Okay, good. Nobody's falling asleep, I hope. All right, um, what you chew and swallow is not inside of you. And a lot of people just, you know, scrunch up their face and look at me and they say, what do you mean when I swallow it? Isn't it inside of me? Well, if I tell you that I could, it, well, let's put it this way. If I went in and took what's inside your intestines right now and drew it out and put it inside of you, you would have severe sickness. You would be ill, you'd have a fever, and a bunch of you would die. What's inside that tube that runs from your mouth all the way down to the other end is not inside your body. It's a solid tube, and every protein that you eat has to be broken down into small sections called peptides. Remember, those are the small, those are the syllables of the words, and they're broken down into amino acids. So those are the letters. And those are transported across the gut wall and taken to the cells for assembly into the proteins needed by the horse. Now, keep that in mind when you take all these protein supplements, such as um, joint supplements, which is almost all protein. They're all broken down into little parts, brought across, 
a solid membrane because proteins are too large to get through. They have to break down to those little tiny things, get transported across and reassembled on the other side. That's what's so cool about proteins, but it's why I don't believe in any of the uh, joint supplements because they're all assembled. If you start feeding a horse more good quality protein, it gets absorbed, and all these joint supplements are really good quality quality protein, you're basically giving your horse protein with specific amino acids. That's what you're doing. Just think about that next time you buy your uh, uh, joint supplements. Anyway, there are some proteins that are not transported through the gut wall, and that's really important to know. Okay, <clears throat> I'll get to, back, get, get to that in a second, but there's some reasons for failure of protein absorption. One, the protein is, just doesn't have the ability to be absorbed. Um, every protein that a horse eats doesn't mean that all of it gets through. Uh, it's just one of the natures of the beast. For instance, half the hay protein that you feed a horse is eliminated. It just never gets absorbed. So it only has a 50% absorption rate, maybe 60 if it's really good. Two, the genetics of the horse. There are some horses that just have a genetic code that um, is just unwilling to absorb some of these proteins. Of course, you have inflammation of the gut wall. Now, the inflammation of the gut wall, I think, personally, is a two-way street. Now, not everybody might agree with this, but I think with inflammation, it, it decreases the ability of the horse's gut to absorb these proteins because the wall is thickened and it just can't be brought in. In addition, there's something called a protein-losing enteropathy, where the disease of the bowel will cause the proteins to actually leak out of the body and into the feces. So you have no protein being absorbed and you have protein actually exiting the body right through the gut because of the inflamed and diseased bowel. And of course, the third reason is inadequate intake of protein, uh, such as starvation, and that causes protein resorption, especially uh, in starvation. In other words, a starving horse will lose all of its body fat, and when that's gone, it will move to its muscles and it will start to digest its muscles just to make up the energy it needs to survive. Uh, just before death. That's why all these um, uh, low body condition horses, the ones that are starving, uh, look like a walking skeleton. All their muscles have been absorbed. I'm going to get into that again when I show you some pictures of older horses. All right, so I use the term bioavailability of protein, and it's an old-fashioned term. Uh, some of the new uh, people say don't use bioavailability, uh, and they have other terms, but I just want you to get the idea. I don't want you to focus on a specific uh, term. But if you ate egg whites, 100% of the protein that you eat in an egg white will be absorbed. If you eat whey protein, 90 to 94% of it will be absorbed. Soy, soybeans will be 80% absorbed. And of course, grass and legumes such as alfalfa, whether it's raw, being you know, eaten right out of the field, or dried, is about 50 to 60% absorbed. Now, this is really important, and I'm going to come back to this when we get into the mass section. In other words, if you eat a pound of soy, only eight-tenths of the pound is going to be absorbed, and two-tenths of the pound is not going to be absorbed. And that's really important in calculating uh, your uh, protein intake. So <clears throat> every protein is made of individual amino acids. And a diet of only one protein will limit the number of essential amino acids available to use. And again, the three limiting essential amino acids are lysine, threonine, and methionine. And there are some supplements out there that will have these. And as you look at some of the protein supplements that you can buy out there, you're going to see listed lysine, threonine, and methionine actually added. And, um, you know, somebody said that it's um, uh, manufactured. I'm not sure if it's manufactured or not. Um, the point is uh, these three aren't found in the environment, and your horse really needs them to, to be um, complete. But the way to get around this is offer a variety of proteins to cover all required EAAs. So, in other words, if you're just feeding hay, it's not going to do it. If you just feed soybean, it's not going to do it. If you just feed whey, you're getting pretty close. Because whey, even though it's made from a cow product, um, all the cow product has been eliminated, and you're just left with the proteins. So that's why I have no problem giving whey protein to uh, a, a horse or to a human because all of the other essential things have been removed. Now, there's different types of whey protein. One is a uh, whey protein isolate, which is the most pure form. Um, it's very expensive, and you're not going to be able to feed it unless you're very wealthy. And 
I'm not too sure if that's the best way to go. So you just get regular whey protein, which is the byproduct of the cheese production, and that's going to give your horse a lot of um, protein and amino acids that he's looking for. All right, so that's basically the reason why we want to give a variety. We want to make sure that there's enough variety that they're getting all the amino acids. Okay, I'm about halfway through, and I'm going to really keep flying through this, even though I'm into the math, because um, I want to get to your questions, because I know a lot of you have questions. But I want to go over the math. Okay, now you've got a bag of your food in the back <coughs> of your car, and, and you rip off the, the uh, ingredient tag, and you're looking at it, and it says crude protein. Well, crude protein is just a measurement of how much protein is in the food. They actually, uh, through analysis, determine how much nitrogen is emitted. And from that, because nitrogen is in almost all proteins, it will, um, it, it, um, will determine how much protein is in there. Um, just a side note, uh, there are some faulty manufacturers who actually injected dog food with pure nitrogen. So when it was analyzed, the crude protein seemed higher, but it really wasn't because actually the protein, the nitrogen finally just blew off. Uh, but they did that by giving urea. And of course, urea was a little bit toxic to dogs and dogs got very sick from that. Uh, it's just a horrible thing that happened, but that's what some people tried to do. That wasn't made in this country. It's made in another country on the other side of the world. Anyway, so crude protein is not an indicator of how much protein that's absorbed nor does it tell you the type of protein. So if you look at your grain or, yeah, your bag of feed and it says 10% uh, crude protein, well, it doesn't tell you how much of that protein is actually going to be absorbed because if 10% if protein, crude protein was egg whites, okay, well, then 100% of it's going to be absorbed. If it's vegetable products, which I actually saw in a major manufacturer, it said protein from uh, vegetable products, I don't know what that means. Uh, so we don't even know how much is being absorbed. So if you're going to feed 10 pounds of feed at 10% protein, your horse is going to get a pound of protein. That's what 10% means. That's crude protein. But it's not a pound of protein that your horse is actually going to ingest, I mean, through his intestines and actually utilize. So if you feed a half of a 40-pound bale of hay per horse per day, then you're feeding 20 pounds of hay a day. Now, that's a good horseman's rule of thumb. Most bales are 40 pounds. Of course, we have three-wire bales, et cetera. I get it. We're just talking about the old-fashioned 40-pound bales, 50 bales to a ton. That's how it came out. 40 pounds times 50 is 2,000 pounds. It would be 50 bales a ton. That's why they were made 40 pounds. And we would feed half a pound per horse per day. That's just regular thoroughbred size. Um, and so it's, it's 20 pounds. Now, hay is about 10 to 16% protein. So for math, we're just going to use the 10%, all right? So 10% of 20 pounds is 2 pounds. That's really easy. If you put the decimal point to the right of the zero and move it over one space, that's 10%, that's 2 pounds of protein. If you're having trouble with math, if your eyes are glazing over, you can always go back to this on the replay or make some scratchy notes someplace. But 10% of 20 pounds is 2 pounds of protein. Now, if you feed one pound of a 10% protein grain, let's say you have some sort of uh, grain, I'm not going to use anybody's name, there's so many manufacturers out there, but you look at the bag and it says 10% uh, crude protein, then if you're feeding 10%, if you're feeding one pound, one-tenth of a pound is going to be protein. That's 10% of a pound is one-tenth of a pound, right? I think you should go ahead and make a list of everything you feed your horse. Hay and grass combined together is roughly about 20 pounds, maybe more, maybe less. And weigh how much feed you're giving, not a scoop, because scoops is ridiculous. Everybody here listening to this, you got to stop feeding by scoops and you got to start feeding by weight. And multiply that weight in grams by the percent crude protein of that feed. And then you're going to find out if you're feeding um, a pound of food and it's 10%, it's going to be 10 of a pound. Wait a minute. What is a gram? <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. All right, because all of us are in America. If you're outside of America, y'all, you probably know, or maybe you know how many grams, but you don't want to know a pound. I want you to do this. Put up four fingers. Just raise them up and put up four. Now, step two, make five fingers. And then step three, make four fingers. And you'll never, ever forget, there are 454 grams to pound. 
454. If you're into Chevy engines, they had a 454 gasoline engine. You'll never forget. But other than that, for all of us else, 454 grams per pound. That's something you should memorize and never forget. 454 grams per pound. So if two pounds of hay in protein is going to be 890, how to get 890? I multiplied two times 454. That's how I came up with 890 grams. It's two pounds of hay. And a tenth of a pound of grain is 450, 454 grams. Move the decimal place over. It's 45.4 grams. If you add 890 and 45, you're going to have a total protein of about 935 grams. But that's not what's being absorbed by the horse. And you've just completed step one of your analysis. You found out how much crude protein your horses are getting. All right, let's go on to step two. Remember how egg white was 100% whey is 90, 94% absorbed, soy 80% grass and legumes are about 50 to 60%. Remember that? This is where it comes in handy. Assuming 50% absorption of hay protein, then the 890 grams of fed hay now becomes 454 grams of protein that's absorbed. I just basically said 50% or one half of 890 is 454. So out of that 20 pounds of hay that you're feeding, only one pound or 454 grams is actually being absorbed in the horse. Okay, take a deep breath. Let's move to the next one. Now, assuming 80% absorption of soy protein, if your grain is just soy protein, it has corn, it has oats, it has molasses, it has all the other things, it has soybean, and it says 20, um, your, your grain is 10% soy, then you're feeding 45 grams crude protein, but 80% of that is 36.32 grams. And how do I do that? Remember, 80% is 0 0.80, so 0 0.80 times 45.4 is going to be 36.32 grams. If you add the 36 and the 454, your total absorbed protein is about 490 grams. So in your horse's daily feed of one pound of grain at 10% protein and 20 pounds of hay at 10% protein, they're going to actually absorb about 490 grams or a little over a pound of protein. But is that enough? So how much protein does a horse need? According to the National Research Council, and according to bodybuilders everywhere, you need somewhere between a half and a gram per pound of body weight. So what that means is, in a thousand pound horse, you need between 500 and a thousand grams. In a 1500 pound horse, between 750 and 1500 grams. I'm gonna go back a slide. We already determined that a horse being fed one pound of grain at 10% protein and half a bale of hay grass egg, maybe some alfalfa, you can up it a little bit. There's going to be 490 grams of protein. And I just said, at the low end, they should be getting 500 grams. Now do you see why I believe horses are suffering from a chronic protein deficiency? Now, this, this range of 0.5 to 1 gram, again, this is the National Research Council that says basically it's the Bible for all nutritionists and what horses should be absorbing. And if you go to any bodybuilding site and ask them how much protein they should be getting, bodybuilders are at least one gram per pound of body weight. Now, some are saying one gram per pound of lean body mass, and some are saying total body mass. And I think it's kind of a moot point. Just look at your horse. If your horse weighs 1,000 pounds, your horse should be getting between 500 and 1,000 grams. And you're already feeding 490. They're deficient. That's what I'm saying. And make it worse. At 490 grams, if it's just coming from hay, and a little bit of soybean, are they getting all the amino acids they need? And I'm going to answer that question when I'm done with the math. Trust me, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to be able to help you answer that question. Okay, so here's one of the things that's really interesting to know. Uh, and, and when you read my article uh, on protein, um, chronic protein deficiency in horses, you can see it at thehorsesadvocate.com forward slash protein. You can even read it at um, the equinepractice.com forward slash protein. Um, just read that article. Almost everyone of you read it already. You should read it again and really uh, take the heart and understand it. But there's about one to three million proteins per cell in the human body.
per cell. And I don't think anybody out there doubts that we're made up of billions of cells. So if you have one to three million proteins per cell, that's a lot of proteins. They're very small. Um, and the half-life of protein is about one to two days. So when your body, when your horse's body makes protein, unless it's hair, fingernails, or hoof, that protein is going to be gone in one to two days, and it's going to be rebuilt. So your body is constantly rebuilding this stuff. What's really interesting is the amino acids can be recycled during the lean times. So as they go through winter and there's not much to feed and they're foraging through snow, um, they're going to be able to recycle those amino acids. They will lose their fat first, and if starvation gets to a point where they start absorbing their muscles, they'll die if the winter is too long. We get it. But the point is they can take the proteins that are being um, uh, just used up and they can make more proteins of it. There's a constant and steady loss. And so we have to keep adding proteins on a daily basis. And what everyone says is between half and a, one gram per pound of body weight. And if you're using your horse or any exercise at all, I would recommend more toward a, a pound, uh, a gram per pound. Now, when bodybuilders are, are you know, lifting weights and building their muscles here, what happens is you're actually tearing the muscle apart and you're asking to rebuild. That's why you don't exercise every day the same groups of muscles. You exercise them, give them 24 hours to rebuild. And in that rebuilding process, the muscle enlarges and strengthens. Now remember, every muscle is attached to a tendon and every tendon is attached to a bone. It's like a, a puppeteer where you have the muscles here and the strings of the tendon and the bones of the, is the puppet. As the muscle contracts, all this is connected. We call it connective tissue. And it's all made up of proteins, specific proteins. And these proteins have to be replaced uh, and maintained and added to if you want to have strength in your horse. These horses that are galloping, galloping, all of a sudden break down with a bow tendon, it's because they didn't have enough to repair. It's, again, the barn that you're trying to build with just finishing nails. By the way, I have another example of this for all of you guys who like to cook. If I ask you to make me an apple pie, 10 apple pies, I want 10 apple pies, and I'm going to give you 100 pounds of flour, 100 pounds of sugar, 100 pounds of butter, and one apple. How many apple pies can you make me? Not even one, unless they're really, really small. Do you see what I'm saying? If you don't have all the ingredients, you can't make the pie, you can't make the tendons, you can't make the muscles. This is why, if you're looking at 490 grams for a horse's an athlete that should be getting more toward 1,000 grams, you're woefully uh, deficient in protein. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Where am I? You're at a far point. I have a couple of questions. Can you open up your questions? Sure. Questions. Ah, oh, there's so many. Let me check the answer. Oh, cool. This is, a cool. this is a new format that we're doing. Um, oh, how can I? Yes, we can. Oh, we see you. Uh, I guess I didn't do the right thing. No. All right. The question is, how did they determine how much protein their horse needs? Ah. Why is this the same as a bodybuilder? Yeah, interesting, because uh, I'm the biggest fan of saying um, horses are not humans. Uh, especially their teeth, their digestive tract, you know, everything. But when it comes to protein, from everything that I could read, they're very similar, whereas ruminants are completely different. Um, and I found that fascinating. And I was a little hesitant to uh, relate uh, bodybuilders to horses. But, well, yeah, muscle is muscle. Um, and that's true. And we have fast twitch and slow twitch fibers, and we can get very complicated in this. And, in fact, I, in my reading, I found that, there are 27,000, 27,000 amino acids in just one protein in our muscles. That just blew my mind. I can't even imagine how, who, who counted that. But the point is, um, nobody really knows how much protein a horse should have. All right? And I don't think anybody, any nutritionist, any guru can accurately tell you how much they need. But I am going to get into my next step. As soon as I finish with this math problem, I've got like, three more slides on math, I will get into how we can look at a horse and determine if it's getting enough protein and whether we can feed too much protein. Is that 
that uh, question was from there. Uh, Abby, I had a question probably that you'll also get into. Is I know I have uh, I know 490 grams is low for a full size horse, but what about the miniature horses? Are they okay with less because they are smaller? Yeah. Uh, remember, uh, the rate is a uh, half to one gram per pound of body weight. So if you have a mini that weighs 300 pounds, you're talking about 150 to 300 grams of protein. So absolutely. Um, and, and I'm going to show you a picture of a mini that's going to make you cry, especially when I tell you the story behind it. And that's in a few more pictures from now, or a few more slides from now. Uh, so, um, Abby, just keep that in mind because this is affecting every breed out there from minis to drafts. Yeah, another question. Yes, uh, Shay just asked, how would you determine the amount of grass and hay consumed if your horses are in pasture and have free access to both all day? Yeah, great question. And again, um, I don't have all the answers. There's no uh, grass meter that we can put on their mouth. Um, and I think if a horse is turned out 24-7 uh, in, a, in a grass field, uh, it's going to get a lot more protein than a horse that's stable half a day. Um, especially down here in Florida during the heat of the summer, we like to bring them in, get them out of the flies. Um, or if it's winter up there and all your fat pastures are covered in snow and it's the, and it's the um, a dormant phase, so the, the protein content is low. You know, there's so many variables to this. It's really, really hard to give a, a straight answer. Uh, so you're just going to have to kind of guess. And the guests actually become very educated. And I'm going to get into that. But let me finish this math calculation, and I'll be able to answer some of those. Yeah, my wife is giving me a note, and that's exactly what I'm going to be answering. Okay. More questions? Yep. Uh, Kathleen uh, asked, actually asked, is excessive sweating a possible indication of too much protein during the summer? Uh, no. Uh, I can pretty much guarantee you that that's not a protein, uh, too much protein. Um, and that's a great question. When I get to can you feed too much protein, that actually will fall on, into that. But I'm not going to answer any more questions for the next three slides because I want to finish the math. <laughs> okay. Hang in there, everybody. I, I will get to them all, and I hope they all be able to answer everything you've got um, except for probably one or two of you. Okay. So uh, in the math, step one, accurately determine the absorbable protein being fed. Determine the target amount. And the difference is how much protein needs to be added. So again, if your horse needs 1,000 grams of protein and you're feeding 490, then you subtract 490 from 1,000 and you end up with 510 grams. You need 510 more grams of protein. Now remember when I say of protein, I'm not telling you what kind of protein. I'm just saying some sort of protein. And you should make it a variety of protein. So again, that horse that's turned on grass 24-7 is going to have one type of protein, but is that pasture also allowing them to get into some leaves, some lichen on rocks, some twigs, some branches, some other kinds of proteins so they can get these different things, even dirt with animals in it like insects. I mean, every protein counts, and we can't determine all the proteins, but if you feed one source of protein, what I call homogenizing the protein, you could be deficient in all the, all the proteins that the source needs, or amino acids. And remember, they don't need 1,000 amino acids all the way across. And this is kind of important. Let's say, I'm just, this is just an example. Let's say you need 1,000 units of uh, amino acid A, and 5,000 units of amino acid B, and 300 units of C, and 400 units of D, okay? If you're only feeding 200 units of C and you need 300, then you will not have any of the proteins even if you have a million units of A and B and D. Each of these essential amino acids, if you don't get the minimum they need, then all the amino acids that are being eaten are limited. And once they're limited, you cannot make the protein. Again, 100 pounds of flour, 100 pounds of uh, uh, sugar and 100 pounds of butter can make more than 10 uh, apple pies. But if you only have one apple, you're limiting the amount of apple pies you can make. And that's what we mean by limiting their amino acids. Matt loves that example. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. He just gave me a look over there. But the bottom line is, if any amino acid is missing, you're going to miss 
all of the amino acids. I don't care how much. So the horse can be turned on grass all day, get all these amino acids, but if it's not getting DL methionine, the hooves are going to look like crap. Does that make sense? Okay, step two. Pick a source of protein. If multiple sources, estimate the absorption. In other words, if you have a sort of um, a uh, protein source that has a mix of soybean at 80% and whey protein at 94%, just pick a number in between, let's say 85. And the reason why you're just going to have to guess is I have yet to see a bag that says we have so many, uh, so much of uh, uh, soy and so much of whey. They just will list soy first and then they'll put um, corn and then they'll put whey. That's one product called calf mana, which has been around since the beginning of time, C-A-L-F yeah, uh, space M-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, calf mana. It's a uh, protein source, and it has soy, corn, and whey. And we don't know exactly how much soy and whey they have, so just pick a number between 80 and 94 percent. I'll just pick 85 percent for math. Again, a lot of guesswork, but it'll give you a rough idea. So determine how much feed by dividing the protein wanted by the percent in the feed. Say what? Okay, let's do it. Remember in the last example, I said you, have, you want 1,000 grams, and you're you know you're feeding 490, so you need 510 grams. So you take 510 grams and multiply it by this 85%. Remember, 85% is 0 0.85. And if you divide 510 by 0, 0 0.85, you'll come out with 600 grams. In other words, you've got to feed 600 grams of this protein up here to get 510 grams that's absorbed. Now, we know that 454 grams per pound, so 600 grams divided by 454 pound, grams per pound is one and a third pounds every day of whatever protein supplement you're getting to get your 510 grams. All right. Um, to me, that's really simple, but I like math. For some of you, you might say, what? <laughs> um, so let me just go back to step one. <laughs> <laughs> My voice says, follow the directions to the back of the bag. Uh, accurately determine the absorbable protein being fed. So, in other words, find out um, um, how much, uh, you know, it says uh, crude protein. Uh, find out exactly how much crude protein is actually being uh, absorbed. And determine the target amount, which in this case is one gram per pound in a thousand pound horse, and the difference is how much protein you need. All right? Second, Figure out what percentage protein is actually being absorbed, and that is dependent on the product. If it's just alfalfa in there, this number is going to be more like 60%. And so you're going to have to feed more of something alfalfa in it to get this 510 grams. Because 510 grams divided by 0.65, you're going to have more here. This is going to be more like 800 grams. And that 800 grams is going to be more like two pounds of something with alfalfa in it. So you have to figure out what the source of protein is and pick a number that that represents. If it's pure soy, it's 80%. If it's pure whey, it's 94%. But most people have a mix because it's more cost effective and, again, gives a broader uh, source of amino acids. And then divide the number of grams that you want by that percentage, and you're going to get the total number of grams you're going to have to feed. And to get it back into pounds, you just divide by 454, and it's at one and a third pounds of this per day. Okay, and finally, <clears throat> you must determine the source of protein in the feed. No matter what you're getting, you have to read the label. Common sources are soybeans, whey, and alfalfa. But there's other sources, and you might have these in here. Flax for one uh, is one example. Coconut, we love uh, Cool Stance. It's um, coconut meal. Uh, this is a great source of amino acids and protein, as well as uh, a, mix, a medium chain triglyceride, which is a fat source. This is great for horses that you want to maintain a little bit of weight on without giving grain. Coconut's a great way to go. Offering peanuts instead of sugar cubes is a great way. And I don't mean, you know, handfuls of this thing. Offer one or two or three peanuts, but every nut that you give the horse is a little bit of protein. Some of the joint supplements I already said, joint supplements are basically good quality proteins that you're feeding. Gelatin has been fed by so many horsemen in the past. They add gelatin and make the hooves look better. Uh, gelatin is basically um, collagen that's been um, processed, so it's more absorbable. Uh, but if you want, you can just get straight uh, collagen. I know uh, you can get collagen uh, protein at anything. Collagen is basically ground up uh, cow bones and ligaments and joint capsules and tendons, which sounds disgusting. 
but they ground it up into a powder and, and all the taste is gone. It's just as a powder. And many people use uh, collagen as their source of uh, protein. So find the protein you're comfortable with feeding. If you are absolutely against soybeans because they're genetically modified, fine. Don't feed, don't feed them. If you don't feel like you want to feed something that's from a cow, fine. Don't feed whey. Go to alfalfa. You're just going to have to feed more. Or add some coconut meal. You might say, well, horses don't eat coconut in the wild. Fine. Find some sort of supplement that fits you. But the variety of amino acids that you can get, it's dependent on the types of proteins you can get. And you also have to go to your area because some of these protein sources are not available in every area that you go to. All right, this is my final home stretch. I know we're at 8 o'clock. You guys have been sitting here for an hour, and I really want to get this done. How do you know? And I say the results are obvious and not so obvious. Uh, there is no test to determine that your horse is getting enough of the amino acids. There just isn't a test out there. Uh, even if you burn up your horse and analyze it in some machine, um, I don't think that's going to be right. Uh, that is probably turning everybody's heads, but it, it's just to make the point. There is nothing that you can do to determine. However, there's something called a top line score, which I think is really cool. I picked this up at the AAP conference from um, my friends at Neutrina. Um, they believe in this ABC D system, which I'm going to go over in a second. So the top line score. The hoof quality. If you have cracks, chips, deformed walls, seedy toe, white line disease, and even laminitis or horses prone to laminitis, you're probably too low in protein. If your horse hoof quality looks really great, they're solid, they're sound, there's no cracks, there's no white line diseases, there's no thrush even, then you're probably feeding good protein. Lameness. If you have got tendons that are falling down, you know, fetlocks that are dropping, ligaments that are getting strained, if your horse has sore muscles and needs massage therapy all the time, if you have joint inflammation, need your joints in injected all the time, there's a good chance that you're not feeding enough protein. It's my hypothesis that if you start to feed a, a good amount of protein, at least a gram per pound of body weight, I'm saying that many of these things over time will go away. Now, you have to understand this is not overnight. This is months, if not a year or more, to get this body back up into shape to meet uh, your, your athletic needs. Everybody knows it takes a year to get a full brand new hoof. I get it. So it's going to take a year to get a new hoof. But remember, the half-life of proteins is one to two days. And if you start to give all these materials that they need, they can start building more and more good quality proteins. And I've seen some changes in as little as two months, especially in older horses. As I see the top line improve, their guts go away, you know, that belly goes away, their whole attitude. They're, I got a phone call from one guy who said, my horse is ready to be uh, euthanized. I, I don't know what to do. It doesn't want to get up. It's lethargic. The only thing the guy did was put it on calf mana up to a pound a day. And he called me two months later and, and, and bent my ear for over 20 minutes. He said, it's amazing. This horse is brand new. He's got a brand new lease on life. Um, and, and I think that's just worth everything. And, of course, the immune system. If you have horses with skin conditions like rubby face, uh, itchy bellies, um, we call the Florida crud down here. Uh, if their lungs are affected, such as COPD or heaves or whatever, or GI tract where they're getting inflammation in the gut and you're seeing all this gut inflammation, I think the number one cause of inflammation is grain. Uh, but that said, we have to heal the gut and make it solid and sound. And I think protein has a big thing to do with that. All right. The top line score, PLS, top line score, A means the whole top line is filled B, uh, or maybe the withers are starting to go. Uh, B, the muscles lost at the withers. C, muscle loss at the withers in the back and the loin. And D, they've lost the withers back and croup. Um, and I want you to, for you to think of the T-bone steak. And, and I'll get to that in a second. Okay, this is the A section of that horse that I showed you earlier. This is the horse that was seen by the veterinarian the day before. And the horse has been, um, this whole farm has had a, a nutritionist on there giving some advice. And I can't went there to float the horse's teeth. And I said, Good golly, what is going on with your horse? All the muscle mass is gone in A, B, C, and D. These are your four areas. Now, this is it really key. When a horse starts to lose condition, it loses it in A first. So B, C, and D can look really good, but A is gone. As the protein deficiency worsens, you'll get A and B together. And as it worsens even more, C is involved, and finally have, like this horse, A, B, C, and D are all involved. 
Now, when you start to add protein and then you're working on the top line, D will fill in first, then C, then B, and finally A. So when you're looking at your horse, you still see a, 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 a hollow in this area. But this is filled in, be patient, it's coming. Also notice the sway in this horse, how it's just down like this, because the muscles that this horse needs to keep this back straight is all being dropped down here by gravity, and all the guts are just pulling this down. It's like a suspension bridge that no longer can suspend the weight below it, and it's just starting to sag. And I think that this horse, once it gets on protein, in the next six months, when I come back and take a look at it, this top line is going to look a lot better. Now, I mentioned the T-bone steak. And this is a T-bone steak, and don't, don't tell me that you're a vegetarian and you don't eat steaks. That's not the point here. You put a saddle on a horse, you need to know about T-bone steak. Let me go back to this picture here. Right where the letter B is, if I took a slice right down here, a section about an inch thick right out of your horse, and also cut them lengthwise from tail to nose, what would be left is this right here. This is the vertebrae. This is where the spinal cord goes. So when you have your T-bone steak, the spinal cord has always been removed. But this is the vertebrae. And out from the vertebrae comes something called a transverse process. That transverse process comes right out about here. So the vertebrae bone has a, a bone that sticks out at right angles and comes out here. And that space between the vertical vertebrae and the horizontal transverse process is filled with this muscle here, which we call the strip steak. That's where the saddle sits. So this part in here is this part that's gone. And you know that if you want to fill in this area, you can do what they do in cattle with grain-fed cattle and feed them a lot of grain. And you're going to get this all filled in with fat. But it's not going to give the strength this horse needs to lift itself up. You must feed protein because this is muscle. It's a huge muscle. And this muscle that sits below the transverse process, this is called your filet mignon. And this muscle also has to be filled. Now you can see there's some marbling in here, some fat, and that adds taste to the meat. But we're talking about filling a horse in and getting strong along this backbone. And you have to do it by filling it with muscle. This is the time I want to tell you a story that was related to me at the AAP meeting by the Neutrina representative. She said that she was driving along with her husband one Sunday, just going to her Iowa fields, looking at all of her hogs. The hogs were left and right as far as you could say. And he's craning his neck left and right, looking at all these hogs. And she says, honey, what are you doing? He says, nothing. I'm just looking at our hogs. They're pretty good looking. She says, yeah, they're rated number one. They're the best hogs in the state. They meet every criteria for being the best pork producing hogs in the nation. They are just top. And he keeps looking. He's going around like this. And she says, honey, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for the treadmill. Exercise programs are important but are nothing unless you add protein and develop this meat. Without the protein, you've got a barn with finishing nails, and you're not going to build it. You must be able to supply protein. So here's another view of this horse taken. You can see the horse looks old, and you can see the, the croup is just, you can see the points of the hip. You can see the sagginess and the bowing out. You can also see here that his master muscles or the cheek muscles are flattened. If you ran your hand along here, there would be nothing in here. This, uh, this is my uh, second horse I've seen where that's the most used muscle on the horse. We're talking about skeletal muscle. We're not talking about the heart beating. So the skeletal muscle, this muscle moves more than any other muscle on the horse. That makes sense. They're chewing all the time. And if this muscle is starting to wear, wear away, it means this horse has chronic protein deficiency. In other words, this horse needs to build this muscle up and it doesn't have materials to build it up with. That's what's happening to this horse. That's why this horse looks like this. And a lot of you guys that have top lines like this in horses, your horse may be only 10 years old and you're getting this uh, because you're working them hard. You need to add protein. Now, look at this mini. And you might have to adjust your eyes for a little bit. But here's the mini. Look at its backbone. It sticks out like a keel of an upside down boat. And look at the depression in here at A and B and C and D. And this is on the same farm as this horse. And this, this person has hired a nutritionist and has veterinarians out, and they're not seeing this. And I'm here to look at the teeth, and I said, what do you think about this top line? And the face on this person just nearly just, just popped open with just 
absolute surprise was he had seen this horse day after day after day and never saw this. And when I pointed it out, you could have knocked him over with a feather. These guys were on the phone while I was working on these horses, ordering uh, protein to come to their farm, and they were starting it that day. That's how much it was so obvious. And what bothers me is, as a veterinarian, we should be able to see these everywhere we go. But veterinarians and nutritionists aren't pointing out these chronic deficiencies, or they're looking at heaves, or they're looking at bad pro, uh, hooves, or they're looking at um, suspensory. They're looking at all these things. Now all of you guys who are watching this or watching the replay now know you've got to start feeding your horse some protein and build this up. This idea that the horse is old is really not it's, – it's like the little child kept, keeps saying to you, but why, Mommy? But why, Mommy? But why, Mommy? And finally you just turn to me and you say, because I said so. And I feel like veterinary medicine has gotten to the point where we're just turning and say, because I said so. But you're still asking why. And I want to just propose this hypothesis that it could be chronic protein deficiency. And let's look at this as a group of people and say, okay, let's just try it. All right. So uh, I promised that I would say uh, something about feeding protein and can you feed too much. I don't think you can. I think a lot of people are starting to believe that you can't feed too much protein. Uh, there's a time where you said, oh, you shouldn't, especially older horses that strains the kidneys. But let me put that into better terms. If your horse isn't getting enough nutrition to stay alive, in other words, he's limited on grass and on hay, and he doesn't have enough sugars to keep going, he will turn the protein that you feed him into urea because when it's turned into urea, they actually get energy from it to stay alive. And that urea is excreted in the urine, and it smells like ammonia, and it can cause some kidney damage over time. But if you're feeding enough um, energy, and that's why I believe most of these uh, protein sources that come either have corn or wheat middlings or all these other grains that I can't stand, but I understand you have to have some sort of carbohydrate with your proteins to make the proteins be utilized for building and construction and repair. If you don't have enough uh, sugar, as in the form of hay and grass, or, or in this case, corn, or oats, I love oats. If you're going to feed anything, feed some soybean with oats, because oats is a, as inflammatory. And although it is for some horses, it isn't as bad as corn. And, and that will give them enough energy so that protein they eat is actually going to be utilized for repair. All right, oh, take home points. Protein is being underfed in horses, being used for any use, and not allowed to sample multiple sources in their environment. Protein deficiency is being seen everywhere in my practice. I see it every day. I repeat this lecture, I, I know I did this morning already, and I repeat it two or three times a day. And protein supplementation may help avoid issues but will not replace repaired tissue. So it's best to give it to prevent. And finally, um, you cannot overfeed protein as long as there's an adequate amount of energy providing carbohydrates and fats. When there is an inadequate amount of even one amino acid, there will be deficiency somewhere in the horse. And there's no list, uh, no test of amounts of amino acids, only the outward signs are evidence. The top line score of A, great hooves, flat abdomen, sound horse, uh, and a positive bright-eyed horse like this is probably horses getting enough amino acids and proteins. All right, I've taken up an hour and 15 minutes of your time, and I really am grateful that you're all here. Um, and I'm, I'm about to get some more questions, but I want you all to go to horseadvocate.com and become a member and learn more about horses. And if you do, you're going to get my free PDF book called The Ten Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship which tells you how I connect with thousands of horses a year, horses I've never seen before, and within 30 seconds introduce my float blade and start floating them uh, with very little uh, resistance. Uh, or you can go to um, the equinepractice.com forward slash books, and you click on this picture, and you can buy it from a publisher or as an ebook. You can even get it from iTunes and load it onto your iPhone and read it anytime. Um, or you can become a new client of ours, uh, and we do your horse's teeth, and I'll mail this to you, signed and autographed. Okay, I'm open to questions, and you should be scribbling down December 4th, uh, top 10 reasons for dental care in horses. Um, I'll go over uh, a bunch of things. It'll be the last webinar for the year. And then I'm going to be taking January and February off, unless my 
um, my host and my team over there uh, say that I should be back here telling more. Uh, but um, December 4th will be the next one. All right, let's hear. Where are the questions? All right. Uh, Rochelle had asked, uh, CROAD has six types of protein. Is that enough to feed the size A and capture graph? Yeah, when it says 55% protein, remember that's crude protein, and that's a lot of protein. The only thing that uh, some, uh, something like ProAd has is that you don't have to feed as much of it. The higher the percentage of protein, the less you have to feed. So if you're trying to make up your protein deficiency with just straight alfalfa, you'd have to feed uh, several pounds to make that up. Uh, whereas with ProAd, you can feed less. If you're feeding straight soybean meal, then you can have to feed more. So whenever you see 55% protein, that's a huge amount of protein in a food, uh, but it, it, there's nothing wrong with that. You just don't have to feed as much of it. So it might be even more economical. So that's the idea behind 55%. Uh, and the question was, uh, is that enough to feed besides hay and pasture grass? Uh, I'm gonna say in, in quotation marks, yes because pasture grass and hay is constantly changing. You don't know the exact protein uh, content of the grass. As you go into winter, it gets um, less protein. And of course, in the summer when it's growing, the rains come, you have more protein in it. Same with hay, uh, every batch is different. Uh, so you just want to pick a number and kind of um, look at the horse. Uh, when you look at the horse and you see the hooves look good, the belly is uh, flattened, and the top line is coming along and looks solid, and the horse seems to be happy, have the energy you're looking for, and isn't having breakdowns, uh, then you know you're feeding enough. And if you want to play a little, little bit, you can back off because you don't want to spend as much money, but you pay attention to the hooves. You pay attention to the hair coat. You pay attention to all these outward signs. And that truly is the only way you can tell if you're feeding enough protein or not. But I guarantee you, most of you out there, if you look at your horses, you're going to say, oh, my gosh, I have a protein deficiency based on what I'm telling you. And as you look at it, you want to change that to where you want the horse to look. You want the horse to look ideal. Next question. Yes, uh, Mayor Beth asked, uh, what food do you recommend, especially for a horse with metabolic issues? Yeah, I'm not too sure <clears throat> where metabolic issues actually comes from. We know that they have crusty necks, they have fat pads. But I will tell you um, that we have this one horse that was our, at our place that has fat pads uh, right around the tail rump, crusty neck, a uh, trough, you know, a groove that went down the back on a body condition score of eight on a scale of one to nine. And without any exercise and with just pasture, we've converted that horse's top line to reduce the amount of fat there. The horse is now getting into shape because we've added protein and we've taken the grain away. So the horse isn't getting abundant amount of sugar, but it's getting the amount of uh, protein it needs and this horse is being transformed right in front of the owner's eyes, right in front of our eyes. It's a beautiful testament to what giving ad adequate amounts of protein can do. And if, I, if you recall way in the beginning, I said that I think that there's a lot of unanswered questions that may be resolved with protein. I would love to see a horse with quote unquote metabolic issues um, start to resolve them, especially if we had some insulin resistance. If you're gonna take them off grain, this is, this is the killer. You have a horse that has metabolic issues, that are obese, uh, that have insulin resistance, that are borderline founder, that you're worried about. And what do you do? You put a muzzle on them. You restrict their diet. They're not getting anything. They're basically starving. And what are these horses going to do? I have no idea why they still look fat, but their muscles are getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And not just their muscles, their immune system and all the other things they need to function as a living unit are being compromised because you're not getting them any protein. So if you need to put a horse on a diet, I would think it'd be even more important to give them the protein they need so they can at least have the metabolic functions that they're supposed to have be maintained. And then watch the weight come off and then get your horse back to where it should be by, by nature. I hope that really helps here helps you Mary Beth and I think um, helps a lot of people when they look at horses if you're starving a horse putting a muzzle on them limiting them out of food they're basically dying in front of your eyes they're miserable they're constantly hungry getting hungrier because they're missing something in their diet try giving them some protein try adding some fat such as coconut meal 
some cool stance, add some cool stance and some protein and try and get this horse's nutritional levels back up to where it needs to be. So it's not needing something, not missing something and see if their appetite starts to lessen and, and watch the body fat melt off. And over a year's time, and believe me, it's not a month. It's not two or three months. This is at least a year of changing these horses back with strict adherence to protein that you may see a difference. And I would love to hear everybody come back to me in six months a year with their stories. Please, Jeff at the equinepractice.com. Jeff spelled G-E-O-F-F. Jeff at the equinepractice.com. Send me your stories and allow me to publish them so everybody can learn. Okay. Abby had asked, um, I see a top line score that goes over the back, but what about the neck? My horse's top neck muscle is pretty strong and drops over it, but I don't see anything at the top line score that wants past the withers. Yeah, usually uh, the neck is is mostly the nuchal ligament, um, and it's and it doesn't have muscle up there. The muscles are actually below the, the top line of the neck, underneath the withers. Um, and if you stretch an elastic band from the withers to the pole, that's the nuchal ligament, and it's basically an elastic uh, fiber connective tissue. Um, that keeps the head uh, supported and prevents it from falling to the ground. Um, so it doesn't put as much strain on the, the neck uh, vertebrae. So that's not the muscles. Most of the muscles that are being used for s support are from the withers back. And I think if you want to move forward, it would be in the hollow of the neck, below the um, mane, below the nuchal ligament, and above the vertebrae, which sit on the bottom of the horse. Um, let's see if I can find this. I don't have a picture of it. But... Um, uh, the, when you look at the side of the horse and the mane, <clears throat> you have to go down to a uh, guy's giving uh, intermuscular injections. That's the muscle. That's why you don't give an intermuscular injection uh, high up on the neck because you're sticking it into ligament and you get a reaction that way. So that's why I think uh, um, uh, we don't talk about uh, the neck as much. Yes. All right. Uh, Taylor, had asked, for a horse who is getting the correct amount of protein, but has an injury where he tore his muscle, would he add more protein if it's something the muscle repair? Yeah, muscle is repaired with scar tissue, and scar tissue is very much permanent. Um, so adding protein to scar tissue uh, isn't going to help. Uh, it will only help in preventing uh, muscle tear in the future because the muscles should become stronger. Um, but a tear is a tear. Laminitis uh, is a tear. A uh, bow tendon is a tear, or suspensory or drop tight locks are all tears uh, in a muscle tear, uh, usually in the hindquarters, uh, which is extremely painful, um, is giving extra protein that's going to help. Thanks, Taylor. I'll be seeing you next week, right? Yeah, you'll be seeing me. All okay. right. Marilyn had also asked uh, uh, back when we were talking about peanut butter. She wanted to know if it was raw peanut, mm -hmm. shell or unshell cooked peanut. What we find is a lot of people just try and experiment, uh, roasted peanuts in the shell, salted roasted peanuts, um, raw peanuts. It seems like it doesn't matter. You're only feeding one or two as a treat. Um, you're not feeding like a pound or half a pound because if you do, the horse is going to get choked. It's just, it's just like you eating peanut butter. It's just, it's not good. But, uh, most people will feed it. If the horse likes it, they take them right shell and all and they just eat it. And the nut provides some protein. It's a nice treat that you're handing to them. It's certainly low sugar, no sugar. Uh, it's a good way. Most horses are metabolic disease or insulin resistance or laminitic horses, but the owner still wants to give a treat. They're turning to uh, peanuts. So um, raw or cooked in the shell, um, have at it one or two each time, and they'll be happy. Yes. All right. Andrea had asked, I have a 25-year-old Arabian that has parathyroidism. Mm -hmm. They said. We do not know if it is nutritional from oxalis or metabolic. We are thinking there may be oxalis in his soy. Yeah, interesting. Any other suggestions other than soy? Yeah, um, when you think about uh, parathyroidism, it's usually hypoparathyroidism that you're saying. Um, uh, hypoparathyroidism can give uh, soft bones and a big head, um, and that's usually from a calcium phosphorus imbalance. You uh, always need 1.1 calcium to one phosphorus. You always need a little bit more calcium than phosphorus. If you're feeding a lot of grain, um, that will cause it. But I'm not too sure about oxalates um, and oxalates and soy. Um, that's beyond uh, what I know, and I don't feel I can answer you um, completely. But just remember, there's so many different varieties of proteins out there. 
The reason why soy is mentioned so much is honestly economics. We have an overabundance of soy and corn in this nation. We're stockpiling it. We don't know what to do with it. So soy has come cheaper, and you're going to see it more and more. Just remember, you're not looking for soy hulls, which you see in a lot of feeds, which are basically floor sweepings. You're looking for the soybean meal. And um, it may be genetically modified. It may be not. Uh, but it's so abundant. It's getting so cheap. That's why you're going to see it everywhere. But if you want to avoid it, you can look at whey protein. Um, you can look at uh, flaxseed, uh, coconut. Um, it just gets more complicated the more you get into it. And if you want it to be easy and cheap, you just get soybean meal uh, mixed in a, a complete formula such as calf mana or neutrinas pro ad. Uh, that one I like because it doesn't have corn. Um, and I think there's uh, Platinum Performance has some, and even Purina has some um, uh, interesting uh, combinations out there. You have to read the labels. You have to try to avoid all the floor sweepings like soybean hulls and uh, wheat middlings. And you want to look for something that just has straight uh, flaxseed or heaven forbid corn as in calf mana. But you definitely need the soy in the way in there to get a broad spectrum protein source. I close my eyes a lot because I'm thinking, sorry, I just do that. I keep forgetting I'm online and you're all watching me. I'm so grateful for all of you. I'm grateful, Matt, that you uh, provided really good format to present this. Um, and I'm grateful for a lot of things, uh, all of you guys showing up for this. I'm going to uh, close the recording in a couple of seconds. And I'm going to uh, uh, get it uh, set up so I, I can put this on the web uh, in the next day or two. Uh, but thank you so much, everybody. Um, any other questions, uh, you'll see it uh, comments of, uh, below the um, um, post that I'm going to make. And you can just leave your comments there. I know I didn't answer everybody's questions. I actually had 11 pages right here of questions that people had asked that I promised that I would get to. But an hour and a half, I'm going to have to cut it off. Um, it'll be on YouTube. Yeah, it'll all be on YouTube. Leave your uh, questions there, and I'll try and get to them over the next uh, several months. Thanks, everybody. Good night.